Welcome back. I'd like to present our next speaker, Wendy Shotu, who is the nurse practitioner for the neurology team at Cincinnati Children's. She was the care manager for the Comprehensive Neuromuscular Center prior to becoming a nurse practitioner. After getting her master's degree in 2010, she worked for eight years <clears throat> in the complex care center at Cincinnati Children's, providing primary care to children with medical complexity. Some of these patients continue to be seen by Wendy in the Neuromuscular Center as well, and she completed her nursing doctorate in 2018 with a focus on transition to adult care. She has been a nurse for a total of 35 years, so that's a long time, Wendy. <laughs> Not too many people have a job that long anymore, that's great. <laughs> Well, go ahead if you can share your, um, go ahead and share your screen okay. and we can get started. There we go. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Is there a way where I can, maybe I can move them down. Okay. I think I'm good. Perfect. This okay. is awesome. Thank you so very much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to talk about transition to adult care. Um, and as Nicole said, that is my, or was my focus for my doctoral work um, after when graduating from Xavier. So um, there's lots to talk about. We'll get started. All right. I'm trying to advance the slides and having a hard time doing that. Is it arrow work? There we go. I got it. Perfect. I have no personal financial disclosures, but I am involved in clinical research trials as a sub-investigator with Dr. Tian. Um, I also conduct my own clinical research, but it is not funded. Just to go back, if you're wondering what that is, that's the Grand Prismatic at Yellowstone. So we're gonna talk today about the definition of transition from pediatric health care to adult health care. We'll outline the differences between pediatric and adult health care. We'll explore a timeline for transition. We'll discuss how we know our kids are ready to transition and then discuss the need for advanced care planning. So what is transition to adult care? It is a process of preparation. It's not one thing, it's a series of conversations over time. Just like we get kids ready for kindergarten by sending them to preschool, teaching them their numbers, colors, reading and writing, we need to prepare our kids with chronic disease to move to adult care, or at the very least, move them to an adult approach to care. The official transition or official definition for healthcare transition is the purposeful planned movement of adolescents and young adults with chronic physical and medical conditions from a child centered to an adult oriented healthcare system. Many of our kids with neuromuscular disease will grow up to be adults and they need to know about their disease, what medications they take, the therapies that they need, and how to navigate the adult care system because it's different. Starting early and helping them learn all they need to know is imperative to success. Um, they need to be prepared to do this. Um, and so by starting early and practicing, they're gonna be ready. Of course, some kids won't be able to participate in decision-making. In this case, helping families know what to expect and preparing them is also necessary. So it's kind of a, it's a family preparation and um, a patient preparation or child preparation. So what's the difference between pediatric and adult care? What's it gonna be like when you get to the other side? Um, pediatrics focus on growth and development. How are we doing? How are we progressing? In adult care, they mainly focus on maintenance of care. Um, pediatrics is family-centered with parents leading the way and making the decisions. In adult care, it's mostly patient-centered. As you might expect, the patient makes the decision. If, you, if you're, a parent and you're thinking about your own health care, your mom and dad aren't making your, their decisions for you anymore, you are. Um, in pediatrics, we're interdisciplinary. Like Dr. Tian says, we've got a big group of children in Cincinnati in our neuromuscular center with a lot of different disciplines. And in adult care, that usually doesn't happen. They're not likely to be interdisciplinary. 
there's some care coordination that happens in the pediatric side, but in the adult world, care coordination is rare. It's expected that the adult patient will be able to coordinate their care, and if not the adult, then the parent or if, um, a supportive person can help. Um, and then in pediatrics, it's the parent's responsibility that their child gets the treatment that they need, medications they need, et cetera, and that will eventually switch over to patient responsibility as kids get older. So why do we have to do this, right? Um, graduating from the pediatric system is a time to celebrate. You were born with um, a disease that, a neuromuscular disease that you've been in the pediatric system all this time, but my goodness, you've made it to adulthood and that is so wonderful. So sometimes it's awkward for an adult to continue to come to our pediatric practice. I've had that question several times from some patients like, do I, do I have to still keep coming here? Is there an adult alternative or when do I need to go? Um, the parental goal would be to foster independence to allow um, your child to thrive and grow. Also, adult bodies may develop adult problems that are best managed by an adult provider. And like Dr. Tan said, keeping in keeping primary care is incredibly important as people grow older. Just like you take your kids to the pediatrician, we also want them to continue a, um, primary care into their adult lives. Um, there's also some limitations in the pediatric healthcare system that people don't necessarily think about. So in general, by the age of 25, adults aren't permitted without special permission to be admitted to the pediatric healthcare system. If the hospital is full, as it often is, especially in winter with respiratory illness, um, admission of an adult to the pediatric system might not be possible. So there just might not be room for them. And in that case, care is going to be deferred to the adult hospital system or adult care system. So familiarity, becoming familiar with what the adult system is like, establishing a trusted relationship with an adult provider will make this a smoother experience. Transition does not equal transfer. So transition, like I said before, is the process of preparation for transfer of care. Transfer of care is when the patient makes and keeps the appointment with the adult provider to establish care. And then we would want them to continue to do that. For all patients, starting early with an adult approach to care is really important. And at Cincinnati Children's in our neuromuscular center, we are currently working very diligently to um, start that process. We didn't necessarily do a great job of it before, but we are really working to make sure that that happens now, particularly as people are living longer, right? So. So let's talk about what the steps are to transition. We're going to go through these steps in detail in the next slides. We'll talk about a transition timeline, the readiness assessment, setting goals, and then taking it with you. And I'll tell you what that means in a little bit. So the transition timeline. If you look very closely at this slide, um, there is the game of life picture. And that game of life is for kids eight and up. And if children can start participating in aspects of the clinic visit and in their care at home, they should be encouraged to do so. I think it's very important to do that. So when do you want to start thinking about transition? Start early. Children as young as three can start participating in their care. We talk, you know, we talk in our clinic visits about stretching, um, and some other things that needs to happen as kids are getting older. And then so it's important to start them early. With kids with cystic fibrosis, they start their transition discussion at diagnosis. So that's pretty early if they get diagnosed pretty early, right? Um, so learning information about their disease is shared with them at a developmentally appropriate level right away. Now as parents, you get a whole different picture. You get the big picture and you don't necessarily want your child to know that. They don't know that at that, at that level, right? So just as they, as they start noticing the differences between themselves, answer their questions simply and honestly. That's gonna be very important as they get older. There are nursing organizations that support, and physician organizations that support um, starting 
to talk about transition at age 12. And this is the Society of Pediatric Nurses, the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners, and the Physician, or physician Organizations are the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and the Mary American, I'm tripping over these names, American College of Physicians. Um, so providers at age 12 should start asking your child questions about their health, how they've been, how things are going. Um, and they may not know all the answers, but that's okay. And that's where your role as a parent comes in is to be their coach. Um, equal opportunity with the males and females so that was hard to find a female coach picture, but it is important that moms and dads participate in helping their children learn more about their bodies as they get older. Um, when I'm seeing a patient that's around age 12, I talk to them and I say, look, you know, you're 12 years old, now you're growing up, right? And they're very excited about that. And then I say, I'm going to start asking you the questions and it's okay if you don't know the answers right away, but we were going to help you practice talking to me about your health and then also have your mom and dad can help fill in the blanks when you don't know the answers and that's okay. And then they gradually take over um, the visits over time. So let's go through age-based kind of things that we want to focus on. So at age 12 or 13, your child's to start learning about their health condition if they don't know it already. They really do need to start learning about their medications and their allergies. I would encourage the patient to ask questions, just like I said before. And what you want to do is to ask the provider if and at what age they no longer care for young adults. At children's, um, just a tidbit and a tip is that youth must give permission or assent for the parents to access my chart starting at age 13. So they will have to sign a form saying it's okay that you see their information. Many parents take care of everything with their child, but again, they need to learn to do it themselves if, if they're capable. And we'll cover, the, we'll cover a little bit about when kids aren't capable. As parents, you're giving them the tools they need to move to adulthood safely and successfully and establishing rapport, practicing answering those questions and talking to the provider is an equally important role that, or task that they must complete. Um, they need to know about their health condition and what to expect as they get older. Um, I talked about the medications. They need to explain to others what medicines they take and why they take them. And also, as they get older, they need to learn to ask others for help, particularly if you've got a condition that's degenerative or where they're going to, their um, motor abilities are going to decline. They will need to direct their care at some point if they can't do it for themselves, and they need to learn that skill. Um, the last point is the but one that about the access to my chart is the one that parents really worry about because they want to um, they want to still be able to see their child's information, which is reasonable. So, practical tip: have your teen help you prepare their medication box. Talk about the medicines as you're laying them out. Review the dose, how often they take it, and why they take it. Um, a lot of kids know that the names of the medicines they take. Teach them both names, generic and the, um, the, the, the generic and the um, trade name because they may hear both of those and they need to understand which is which. Um, and then at clinic visits, make sure your child's um, able to answer or, and allow your child to answer. Try and let them answer first. I always look at parents after the child has answered and say, do you agree with that or do you have anything else to add? Um, and that seems to work pretty well. Age 14 to 15, find out what your child knows about their condition and begin to assess what they need to learn. Um, they should be carrying their own insurance card. Um, your child should learn more about, continue to learn more about their health and what to do in case of an emergency. You can help them practice make appointments and getting prescriptions refills done. Um, and then they need to start begin to begin to see their healthcare provider alone for part of the visit and that helps them learn independence. So practical tip for that, ask your teen to make a list of questions and concerns for the visit. You can do that together if you'd like, but that helps them start thinking about, okay, my visit's coming up, what do we need to talk about? What are things that are worrying me today? 
um, start talking about what insurance covers and what it does not cover. I mean, talk about co-pays. These are just little small things that we can do over time. So by the, by the time your child's an adult, they're ready to go. Age 16 to 17, have them, again, make the appointments, see the provider alone, and ask questions and, and refill their medications. Um, ask the, um, the, the facility that you're going to about privacy rights once they turn 18, because they need to be prepared for that. And you need to be prepared for that, too, because um, at 18, if they're their own guardian, um, they don't necessarily need to have you or have you um, have that information shared hopefully they will but um, that's that would be one of their rights um, work with the health care provider to start making a medical summary and keep a copy for yourself and then find out if you'll need help making decisions about your health we're going to talk about that a little bit more later um, and then talk about what age you'll transfer to a new provider if that's going to happen so practical tip Allow your child to answer all the questions about their health at age 16 to 17. Keep reviewing the medicines, doses, and reasons for taking. Sometimes those doses change over time, and they need to be aware when they do change what the new doses is, are. Sorry. If your child is having any new symptoms, allow them to share those with the provider, and then be prepared to step out of the room during some conversations. Another, time, another thing at this point is you really need to start planning for adulthood, whether that's job or school, things outside the healthcare arena. So at age 18 to 21, your youth is a legal an adult at age 18. Parents are not able to access health records without permission. So working with the health provider to find a new provider if indicated, and again, especially for primary care, I can't stress enough um, the need for our patients to continue in primary care. Even if you mostly see the neuromuscular center, um, it's still important that your child have primary care for shots and things like that, things that we don't necessarily do at Children's. Um, Continue to update the medical summary and have this sent to the new provider. Keep a copy for yourself so you've got that. Um, if you are, if your child is transferring to a new provider, have them call to schedule the appointment and make sure that that new provider has the medical records and ask if you'll need to pay anything at the visit. So that's something that the kids aren't necessarily um, aware of. Um, and then the one other big thing is to be sure you're on time for the visit in the adult world. If people are late for their appointments, they're not going to be seen. So there's some arranging, and I've got some other tips to talk about in a minute. Um, learn about other changes that might start affecting you at this age, Social Security, health insurance, things like that. So practical tip, ask your young adult if they're okay with you coming into the exam room. That's a big change for a lot of people, but they are 18, they're their own person, and it's important that we respect. Um, where they are. Think about staying in the waiting room and allowing them to see the provider by themselves. That's okay to do too because they're practicing and they're learning how to take care of themselves and you're going to have a much more successful experience if they are fully prepared. And then continue to guide your young adult and answer questions. You'll never stop being their parent, right? Um, continue at age 22 to 25. Um, care with the health care provider learning to manage the health care and update that medical summary. Keep updating it as things change. Make sure that they stay insured. If you change insurance, make sure your health care provider takes that insurance and learn about charges for the visit. So practical tip, your adult child should be ready to go, but be there when they need you because they will continue to need you over time. My kids are 28 and 20, no, 27 and 29. Um, they still need their parents. So let's talk about readiness assessments. Are you ready for the next big thing? So how do you know if your youth is ready? Your care team should assess your youth readiness for transition. At Cincinnati Children's, we are developing at this minute um, a, a readiness assessment tool to use in clinic for kids starting at age 13. Um, 
just and it's just a tool right it's just something that can help us figure out what they know what they don't know and then we can make goals based on um, what we figure out you can do your own assessment online with this online quiz gottransition.org is a phenomenal resource for patients for providers for researchers to help with transition to adult care. So it's a, it's a group out of the Maternal Child Health Bureau in Washington, um, and they, I, I'm on a transition um, kind of listserv, and they are the gurus for transition, and they really get it done nationally. Um, so I would highly, highly recommend exploring some of the things that they've got on their website. They have new and improved tools that just came out maybe a month ago. So I would really recommend that. So readiness assessment, what are we checking out? Does your child know their healthcare needs, their medicines, allergies, we talked about some of this, insurance and emergency contact information, can they make their own appointments, do they know who to call, and what do they know about emergency care? This is just a sample um, one from Got Transition. There's something called the TRAC, the Transition Readiness Assessment Questionnaire. I know at Children's, we've, we're developing our own right now for use just so we can start using something. And here's the biggest question. What if my youth has cognitive delays? Some youth have physical disabilities and no cognitive disabilities. They can make decisions for themselves and they should do this. Some will have both cognitive and physical delays, and you'll need to continue to help them into ad adulthood. Others just have cognitive delays. Physically, they do okay. They can take care of themselves, but they can't make decisions. And sometimes, it's really hard to know. So, and even for, for us providers, um, you go in, you meet a kid, they seem pretty on it, but then we start asking questions, okay? So, um, we talk about what I, I did this pretty recently in my clinic. I had a guy that I wasn't sure kind of where they were. And, um, he said, Hey, I said, so if you go into McDonald's and you get a cheeseburger and it costs a dollar and you give the cashier $20, how much money are you going to get back? It was a pretty simple math problem. They had no idea. Um, so that gave me a cue that, Oh, we need to get this figured out. Um, and that puts them at risk, right? Because people can take advantage of them if they figure out that they don't know how to count money. Um, they also need to understand safe, safety. You know, the next door neighbor is really nice, but, um, and you think they might be okay, and or you know that they're not okay, and your child doesn't know that at all because they're nice to everybody. Um, that neighbor might, or whoever, may take advantage of them and cause harm. That makes us sick to our stomach but it's a true thing. So we need to make sure that um, we're keeping our kids safe. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a um, term called, I call tweeners, and I literally stole this from a father who said, explained that his son was a tweener, right? So the kid was in regular classes, advanced classes. He was ridiculously smart, but this young man, he was a teenager, couldn't rationalize that if it snowed on Sunday, like snowed pretty hard and the roads were covered, but they were off school on Monday, that by Tuesday the roads would be clear. He had no idea he would have big meltdowns and it was a big problem in their family. Um, so those are kids where I would rec highly recommend neuropsychological testing um, Dr. Tian kind of mentioned it earlier. Um, Dr. Graf, a little bit later, will maybe cover a tiny bit of that too. But the neuropsychological testing is testing that can be done by a neuropsychologist and help us learn what supports um, the kids will need into adulthood. So there's guardianship versus supported decision making. Guardianship removes all legal rights, okay? So your child won't be able to vote, they won't be able to manage their own money, they, they're not, they can't make their own medical decisions. We do recommend the least restrictive. If your child's cognitively able, we want them to be able to answer questions and, and, or do things on their own, right? So there's things like medical power of attorney, financial power of attorney. Um, so you'll wanna check what the rules and regs are in your state and counties. 
um, and figure that out. So it's important for kids with the uh, cognitive delays to have those supports in place. Um, once guardianship is obtained, though, it's really hard to get it reversed. So be cautious about what decisions you make with that. So how do we set goals? Um, how are we figuring out what our kids need to focus on when we do these readiness assessments? So they need to obviously focus on answering questions. Again, I can't stress enough, what are the names of the medicines? What time do they need to take them? Why are they taking them? And how do they get refills? Do they know what pharmacy they use? Um, how do they make appointments? And then directing care. Um, and then a tip for success for setting goals. Identify the goal. What information does the youth need to reach that goal? Identify the steps to achieving the goal. What problems will, it, will make it difficult to achieve? And who does the team need to ask for help? Hopefully it's you or another trusted adult. So I'm gonna give this example. My son was in college before even I addressed any of this, right? I didn't do a good job of getting them prepared for some things. I didn't think about it. Nobody talked to me about it before. So he called from college and said, Mom, I need to get my prescription filled. I was like, okay, well, go to the pharmacy. But, but, but what, I do, what do I do? He wanted the little tiny details so he didn't feel ridiculous when he went to the pharmacy. So I was very specific. I said, okay, you've got your prescription. You're going to take it. Um, to the pharmacy down the, uh, the corner and you're going to get out of your car and make sure you've got your wallet with your insurance card and you're going to go back to the pharmacy. You're going to say, I need to fill my prescription. They're going to ask for your insurance card. They'll ask you other things. Just answer the questions. They'll get your prescription ready and then you'll take it home and then take it as you're supposed to. So little tiny details like that can be helpful for the success um, that they need to be able to even look at other health related things. What to bring, what are you supposed to take with you when you go to a new provider? Your insurance card. What are you gonna do about paying for the visit if there's a copay? Um, your medical summary, because the new provider is gonna need to know that. The list of medicines and any questions that you might have. Medical summaries can be on paper. You can have the phone app. Um, I know the iPhones, which I have, he has a very lovely health section where you can list medical conditions, allergies, meds, contact information. Um, if your child's got, if, if you've got, if your you know, provider has my chart available as part of um, the Epic charting system, then that's an awesome thing to have on your phone to be able to pull information up. Paper version would include name and date of birth, the primary and specialty team, primary care is what I mean, and specialty team is all the specialists that your child sees. Again, medicines, allergies, latest vital signs if possible. Um, if your child has a feeding tube, a G-tube, um, what was the latest feeding plan? I will tell you, at adult facilities, they don't have dietitians as readily available as Cincinnati Children's, or really very fortunate children's. But that latest feeding plan is gonna be super helpful. I know at University of Cincinnati, they've got one dietitian for their whole center. So that kind of speaks to what I'm talking about. Any past surgeries, immunizations, also very important. And then who's responsible for medical decision making? Emergency care, make sure they, you bring your emergency care plan. Dr. Tan talked about that earlier. Um, at Children's in our neuromuscular center, if our kids have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, they've got, they're on very, a lot of different things that affect them. Um, it is a degenerative disease, so it's important that emergency care um, is outlined very clearly. Um, we have an emergency care plan that we've developed that we hand them an, an updated one at every single visit. Um, if you don't have one, make sure you know what you need, like those anesthesia risks that Dr. Ortiz talked about earlier. So tips for the first appointment, know where you're going. Do a practice run if you're not sure, because you again, you don't want to be late. Be on time. If you have to take transportation, public transportation in particular, make sure that you ask for them to come pick up as early as possible to get to the appointment on time. 
if the transportation doesn't show up, like that sometimes happens, that's a real thing. Make sure you call the office to explain what happened so you don't get dinged for not showing. Um, and then bring a support person to help remember everything that's going on in the visit. And don't forget about life planning. Post-secondary education, like a college or trade, um, we do at Children's have vocational education available to help. Um, they are very well schooled. That's all they do is help people get ready for the next step. You do need a referral, and I do say that you need to make the phone call to make that happen. They're not going to call you because they're busy and they've got a huge list of people that they need to talk to. But if you call, they will address it, address you right away. Um, any employment considerations. If your child has special needs and isn't going to be able to work, is there a day program available or what other options are there? Be sure you're connected with your local resources. Your county developmental disability services, their job is to help your child go from the child-centered part, like grade school, high school, into college and adult life. So make sure you're connected with them. Look at SSI and SSDI. And then puberty, relationships, sexuality, general safety. Some people don't want to talk about that. Oh, no, but your child is going to go through puberty. Make sure you're explaining things to them in a developmentally appropriate way. They also are sexual beings. It's important to acknowledge that and to help them understand, again, what safety, if, there need, if there's a safety concern. Other resources. Um, we're fortunate here in Cincinnati to have our University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, or USED, that's a big thing. There's USEDs in all over the country. But we do have a transition boot camp coming up on Thursday, November 5th. It's going to be virtual, so everyone will stay safe. Um, but they're working on their agenda now, so keep an eye out for things like that. They are on Facebook. Go on and look them up. Um, so it's the University of Cincinnati University Center for um, education and developmental disabilities. And then one thing people don't necessarily like to talk about, but it's an important component of transition to adult care, is advanced directives. And this discussion is and should be part of the life discussion, right? So knowing what loved ones do or do not want is really an important component. Um, it could be a difficult subject to, to discuss we are bringing this up at clinic visits. Um, knowing what your child or what your youth wants if they come to an end of life time um, is a gift to the family. I'll give you an example. We have, we've had young adults come to the hospital in an unresponsive state. And because no one had discussed this with them, the family had not discussed it e either, nobody really knew what they wanted in you know, as, as providers, we want to respect the wishes of the person that's coming to, into the hospital. Um, we've also started talking to some of our guys with Duchenne about legacy. So what legacy do you want to live? Some have decided to donate their bodies to science. And we've learned a couple of things about the heart um, based on that, things we had no idea. We thought there was scar tissue that developed in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and based on autopsy results, we figured out that it's not really scar tissue, it's fatty infiltration of the muscle. So that's, that's a, we learned a lot from that, and it helps us figure out other ways to help treat, okay? Um, it's important for the patients, um, for their goals and their wishes to be known. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer. Somebody, people say, I want everything done. That's fine. Other people say, I want compressions, but I'm okay if you give me medications to help. That's great too. It doesn't matter. It's just knowing um, what your, what your um, loved one wants. Um, my family knows that if I get hit by a truck on my way home from work and I'm never going to be me again, I don't want to be here. That's my decision. Um, and it's okay to have those conversations with people. And it's okay to have those conversations with your loved ones. Um, it looks like I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try and be quick. There's five wishes, um, and that's a document that we have at Children's and we've started using. And it's, this is a, kind of even maybe a little softer approach into the conversation. So the person I want to make care decisions for me when I can't, identifying who that person is, the kind of medical treatment I want or do not want, 
how comfortable do I want to be, how I want people to treat me, and what I want my loved ones to know most. Um, there are two different things um, also besides five wishes. There's something called a MOLST, which is Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, or if you're outside of Ohio, a POLST, which is Portable Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Um, there's some resources that I've given you here. I've got the USAID, um, which is USAID.org. Um, also some things on advanced directives. Again, got transitions, fantastic. If you've got a kid that's got um, some developmental delays, but they're able to work, Project Search does a fantastic job. They, are, they were started at Cincinnati Children's and now they're worldwide, so they do a really good job for people with disabilities. Um, there's some other resources, some books to read, um, and um, to find to talk about um, transition to adult care. I'm at the end of my talk. I thank you so much um, to the Muscular Dystrophy Association for allowing me to talk about transition um, and, to, and for everything that you do for our patients. It's so meaningful for them. And then also, um, thank you to our neuromuscular team at Cincinnati Children's. We've got a fantastic team. Um, really, I worked in complex care for a long time. Coming back to the neuromuscular team as a nurse practitioner, once I finished my doctorate, was so awesome. And I feel so blessed to be able to work with the people that I do. And now I'll take some time for questions. Thank you, Wendy. I think a lot of that you, any parent can relate to, you know, trying to get your child prepared for the future and you can never start, I guess, at an early age or, or a too early age rather. So Correct. I Correct. think whether your child is healthy or not, um, I think that's just great. Yeah, all of, all of this applies to typical yep. kids too. Yep, yep. exactly. Yep. Um, just a kind of a question on over, um, on generalized care. So, if the neurologist, um, so if you're gonna change neurologist to an adult neurologist and you're gonna mm -hmm. have to change um, care facilities, would, right. you, would, you, can, would you then change all of the ancillary services to adult or would you wean those in um, or would you still go back to, to say the cardio at the children's hospital? How, or is it kind of you jump ship with all practitioners? I I think it depends. <laughs> okay. So I think it depends on the condition. Um, it, it also depends on what's going on. We are fortunate to work with Dr. Kushloff, who's going to be presenting later. Mm -hmm. He is the medical director um, over at the University of Cincinnati of their neuromuscular program. So, and he comes to see patients with us on Thursdays. So if, you're, if your child has a condition, that is able to be transferred over to the University of Cincinnati. We would we we help arrange the appointments at Children's while you're still seeing everybody else, um, so that you're familiar with Dr. Kushloff and the practice and start practicing that adult model of care um, before we would transition over. And he'll take, like some, some kids don't need all of that extra support, like the cards and palm. Um, okay. they mostly just see a neurologist. Um, and he, he helps them make that decision too about when to come over. I think the biggest thing is, you know, at age 25, it's that magic thing. We need very special permission to allow somebody to be admitted to children's. Mm -hmm. So be, that familiar, familiarity with the adult system is gonna be super important. And that was another um, question that had came in was, our children's hospital sees people till 25. Would you recommend us leave at 18 or would you stay? So I think, again, it probably depends on their situation. I think it depends on their situation. Um, you know, again, there's not, you can't educate yourself enough about how things are going to be and what you need to know, right? So yeah. just, I can't stress enough, just be prepared just in case, right? Because it's going to be a different experience. It's different, you know, it's different from when my kids were going to their pediatrician and all of a sudden they are going to an adult provider. You know, you don't know things, <laughs> even though you really want to. Um, but, you know, again, getting them ready, getting yourself ready is going to be important because, you know, face it, a lot of our families are going to be continue to be responsible for their child's well-being. Um, and that's okay. Um, but as much as we can get them independent, it's going to be important too. We've had some guys that need to live independently. Their families died. Mm -hmm. um, 
and having them direct their care and help with the help of aids or things like that, that can totally happen. Mm -hmm. And the other thing just to for some hope is we've got guys working. We've got a guy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy in his late thirties that is working. Um, that's oh. fantastic. We're so excited. That's uh, amazing. We want that kind of a success. Yeah. That's just awesome. Yeah. And I think too, it, this is such an important topic because our, our children are living a lot longer with neuromuscular. They're living disease. so much longer. Oh my gosh. When I was here 10 years ago as the care manager, there was no clinical research going on. Mm -hmm. Or if it was, it was like an in-house, there was no clinical trials, nothing. And then I came back to, you know, eight, you know, two years ago and they said, well, you know, you're going to be working, doing some clinical trials. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Talking about, and it was—it's really awesome because there's so much more hope with you know things that Chin Mai talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, just amazing things that we're doing now. It's an exciting time to be in the neuromuscular field. Very exciting, and I know Dr. Kushloff is going to um, point out, point out some of those clinical trials and updates and research coming up next. So, so many things we're doing. Yeah, it's yes, really, really a lot cool. of things. Yeah. I not see any more questions that have come through, Wendy. So I just want to thank you for your time this Saturday. Thank I you so much. much. Have yeah. a good rest of your day. You too. Have a great day.